Hello and welcome to Matt and Mike Poll Focus. I'm Mike. And I'm not. And today we are talking to Vin Hawke, uh, star of The Terror and Battle Over Britain, about his favourite film, Goon. So I've got to start with an apology, Matt, about this one. I'm sorry again that I uh, I left you in the dark, having to hold the microphone single-handedly. So, so you speak. should be. Uh, but no, it's absolutely <laughs> fine. I did a great job on my own. You did, and, uh, as always, as always. <laughs> no, you were greatly missed, Mike. What was really um, interesting about this one was that, you know, I, I kind of uh, I assumed I was getting an actor and an actor only. Uh, but it actually turned out that, like, Vin's career started in music. Yeah. Um, and he was pretty big into, like, the punk and sort of metal scene in Manchester in the early noughties and, you know, toured and, you know, went around did that and it was only uh you know in sort of 2008 2009 that he took this like you know complete kind of almost like career u-turn yeah and became a writer and then uh, uh sort of consequently an actor so that was really interesting to talk to him about the, those days and yeah it sounds like you uh, got on more about uh music than you did about films which is uh surprising yeah if, if it certainly flowed like uh, pretty well and uh, we actually had a lot of um sort of you know similarities in taste and obviously uh in in, in our careers as well actually in terms of the sort of um the, the change from mainly being into sort of music production and and, yeah. and, and performing live to you know doing more film work so mm-hmm. yeah there was a lot of uh, interesting and slightly sort of um, you know coincidental parallels yeah especially since we share a love for the same football team as well blue moon <laughs> you saw me standing, standing alone. alone roll tape <laughs> You'll have to prompt me about shit, because I, I prompt me about my life, because I'll just forget shit. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I'll be asking all the questions, and I'll be uh, Googling and stuff like that on the phone. <laughs> okay. uh, we keep it quite loose, and we don't really research that much. Like, you know, I've, I've obviously, I've looked at your IMDb. It keeps it organic it, and, a bit, doesn't it? And it? we've met before once, years ago. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, <clears throat> was that at the uh, golf place? Yeah. Or was it at well, Ben's about, house? I can't remember, because it was too... Yeah, 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 we shifted from golf place to Ben's house, didn't yeah, we, or something? Yeah, you were hitting the balls, and you were sort of... You were like the gangster character. <laughs> yeah. And it was great. I loved yeah. that. And I called... Really yeah. Who was, who was acting with us? It shouldn't have been. It was it Alex? It was Alex, yeah. I called, <laughs> it him, shouldn't have been. called him Percy. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. He was I like remember. your little... Yeah, that was like, it. Yeah, yeah. Sort of thing. Well, was yeah. It was good fun, that. We yeah, did, it was cool. I think we did about six episodes of that or something. Yeah. It was a good web series. It was fun. That's kind of how I got started, really, on the sort of web series for different people and stuff. Um, but yeah, because they were all future works. Did you go future works? No, I was I was SSR just yeah. before it became Spirit. Right. Um, so, but they, yeah, they were all future works people. And I think they both work for like I think Ben is like BBC, and I think uh, <clears throat> I think Alex is like City. He's he he's City. like the main media guy at City now. Yeah, yeah, yeah he's he's mental. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and I'm a City fan, so it's cool. I keep in touch with him a little bit. Well, I said I, I messaged him uh, because I was watching the Terror. And I, oh, shit. I recognized you. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, I know that guy. You know, so I'm sure I do. You know, I was sort of hard. So you watched the terror randomly? Uh, I watched what happened was I started it when it came out and then I, I dropped it uh, yeah. just because of kids and stuff. And I picked it up a few months ago and I spotted you and I was like, I know that guy. Who's like, he? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's just one of those <laughs> things went off in my head and I Googled it and I thought, Vin Hort, right, okay, I'm sure I've worked with him before years ago. Yeah. And then <clears throat> I text Alex. Ben or Alex, I think it was Alex. Yeah. And and I said, do we know Vin Hogg? Is he was he in the Annoying Dead? And he was like, oh yeah yeah. And I was like, so I was like, great, I'll, I'll contact him. So and then Phil Broadbent as well. Oh uh, shit, I fucking out. love Phil. Yeah, he's man. great. Yeah, he yeah, had yeah. great things to say about you as well. No, he's I love a, it. Like I would always get him in. He's that good and he's that same thing. He's that lovely. I would get him into every job that I do if I could. Yeah. And we do that with each other, which is cool. Oh, that's yeah. really sweet. Yeah. No, we we um we sort of like we, we knew each other through Carl. Like uh, oh, you know, Carl doing loads of work yeah, with yeah, him. Yeah, yeah. And because uh, you're in Pandora as well, weren't you? A little bit. Yeah. I was in yeah. the drug den team. You there for that? Uh, no, I, oh, okay. I wasn't. I didn't work on it at all. Oh shit. He said he was re-recording all the dialogue. So then we I, did do yeah. some ADR. I remember. Yeah. yeah, I remember doing some ADR. Um, and then I know it's released now. It's on Amazon and stuff. Mm. Finally. Yeah, that's a um, whole saga, isn't it? Yeah. Like Phil's been telling me all about yeah. that. Yeah. So I don't know anything about it. Yeah. And people message me about it, and I'm just like, I don't know. Yeah. Just if you enjoy it, enjoy it. Yeah. What what went on behind the scenes? Don't know. I turned up for two days, maybe one day. <laughs> yeah. And I was grateful for that. Well, these things become these big stories, and you think, you know, sometimes you might only do a, a couple of hours or a couple of days or whatever it is on it, and it just becomes like this big thing. But, yeah. You know, and uh, I think that's the thing with like fandom. It's like, you know, you want to talk to these actors about the projects and stuff, but you realize that to them, it might only be a, a very, very small part of their life. Mate, you know? I, the amount of times I've been at a desk signing stuff and meeting people. Like, cause I do a lot of war films, right? yeah. a lot of war films. And people come up and they'll talk to me about like the Spitfire and the plane and stuff. And I'm like, dude, I don't know. Yeah, I, don't like, know I know a little bit. Like <laughs> in the new one, in Battle Over Britain, 
I learned how to actually fly the Spitfire. Like, I knew that gauge was that. Wow. I knew that gauge was that. I knew that gauge was that. I didn't. We didn't go up in it. No. But like, I like I spent time in simulators. I researched like what would happen if it was this mark. Like, if it was Mark Three, Mark Nine, whatever. Yeah. Um, you wanted to know where to th- look and all that stuff yeah. because that's what makes it real for me. And if it's real for me, it's real for you. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. that's important. But I couldn't tell you why they were. What, what the fuck the markings were or yeah. if they were right or wrong or <laughs> if it if it happened or if it didn't I'm just like I'll do the words I'll understand where I am in the situation yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. well I've, you and um, the directors Callum Callum yeah yeah uh, Callum what's his surname Burn Callum Burn I mean you guys are like single-handedly bringing back the World War 2 movie I mean like you guys have done three in the last like five years is that correct <laughs> Yeah, four, four, five or six maybe with short films as well. Oh wow! I can't take any credit for that. I just keep turning up and they just keep giving me words to say. <laughs> yeah. And so like they, he, so it's his, him and his dad and his and his best mate Sam. So there's three of them: Callum and Andy, father and son, producer and director, and Sam. Um, so uh, Sam Parsons, um, Callum and Andy Byrne and Sam Parsons, and they are this unit called Tin Hat Productions. Right. So Andy is. Andy the father is literally prop master, script writer, producer. Callum is director, producer, script writer. Wow. Um, Callum's in it from time to time. Andy's in it from time to time. Yeah. Like playing like this. Andy will play this dodgy character behind a piano. Um, <laughs> who's like, who will just pop his head up a bit, a little bit carry on. Yeah. Um, and I fucking love him. Andy is one of my favorite people in the world. Callum oh. is one of my favorite people in the world. Brilliant. But Sam, the DOP. Um, so these guys live in Lincolnshire. Sam lives in London. They went to Met Film School together. How did you guys meet? Uh, <laughs> Jesus, right. So. Um, we were on a B movie in yeah. 2010. No, it wasn't 2010, was it? Can't have been 2011. 20, 2011, 2012. We're on a B movie. Start of 2012 called The Drift. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, right, okay. Yeah. Um, and you know what? It was so much fucking fun. It was so, it was so good. Right? I, how did it get onto? The, right. Let me skip back here. Yeah. So 2010. I, I'm a massive gamer. Right? I love Halo. I'm an yeah. Xbox guy. Um, and somehow I found out about this Halo fan film that was being made. And at this point, everyone was making Halo ha- Halo fan films mm. because Halo 3 had come out, Halo Reach was coming now. And there was rumours about a feature at that point. Wasn't exactly, there? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and Microsoft and Bungie, I think, were giving cease and desists to everyone. Wow. This is my, this is my remembering of it. I might be completely fucking wrong. <laughs> but um, my understanding is that the one we were doing called Operation Chastity was the only one that was, wasn't was given a cease and desist. Yeah. And the guys at Bungie Microsoft were like, keep going it's cool we're not going to stop here but, <laughs> wow. but it's not nothing to do with us but we like it keep going yeah and because it's because it wasn't anything to do with master chief or any of that it was just this squadron um this platoon of soldiers in um argentina so it was nothing to do with the main story it's like what happens in this arse end of nowhere in the jungle kind of like predator i guess yeah yeah um uh so we met a a gent on that who was the location manager because we did it on an RAF base Oh, right, okay. Because, yeah. you know, military, we needed VFX, um, like we needed slates so we can have the Pelicans taken off and all that kind of yeah, shit. Yeah. And on one of the behind the scenes that I watched for it, this guy said, that ca- that monitor, this monitor that we're watching the BTS stuff on, actually costs more than my films. I was like, oh shit, what does this guy do? And then it turns out we like sci-fi. I like sci-fi. Yeah. So this 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 guy's called Dad Scales. Um, and I'm still mates with Dad to this day. I don't speak to him as much uh, anymore, but I'm still mates with him. Um, he was turns out he was making this film called The Drift, which was basically um, salvage operators in on deep sea uh, deep space missions that just have to beg, borrow, and steal. And there's there's some subversive like anti. I guess Tories. Yeah. I guess there's the there's Tories that run space the Tories. secret government space Tories. <laughs> the worst type, the yeah. worst kind. Yeah, that that secretly recruit you to get the tech so that they can keep it and all of the blue collar workers are fucked. Right. So okay. but they keep you in the dark and all that kind of shit. So I play the a double agent they for say, the Tories. They, they say you put your politics into your films without realizing it. So this guy's clearly uh, <laughs> yeah, it's clearly Yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe that's there. what it was. Yeah. yeah. But it was good. So anyway, that's yeah. where that's where me that's where me and Andy met. Um, and then I met Callum after, and Andy said, and at this point I was a musician more than I was. My history was in music more than it was film, and I was transitioning yeah. to film at this point because I shifted 2008 to film, um, and then I stopped being a musician 2009, 2010. Yeah. Um, and I was speaking to Andy. He was like, "Oh, Andy says, oh, my son goes to Met Film School in in, uh, in London um, with his mate Sam, and they're making a short film." So, like, oh, okay. He's like, I haven't got anyone to do the music. And I was like, oh, I'll do it. Yeah. So we just wrote this discordant off-key. 
ethereal guitar track mm. and Andy and Colin were like, it's fucking brilliant, love it. Yeah. And that was where we first, all three of us got working and then they made a short film called Fusilier. Yeah. Going back to your fucking original question four years ago. <laughs> um, they made a short film called Fusilier in, at the end of 2012 which was about the, the, the role of the Lancashire Fusiliers in the evacuation of Dunkirk. Wow, okay. So it was like 20, 30 minute film. Yeah. That kicked on to another one called Frey Bentos which is about, so you know the pie is Frey Bentos? Yeah. Yeah, right? In the First World War, there was a tank crew, the very first, one of the very first tank crews. Um, one of the tanks was called Frey Bentos because it made the crew, they, cut, they named it that because it made them feel like they were just stuffed in this meat tin. Right. Yeah, yeah so they named it after that. Um, and it became, they became the most decorated tank crew of the First World War. Wow. They got stuck in a bunker, in, in a shell hole in no man's land, literally in the middle of the and the British and the German lines. Mm. Germans came kept coming to try and take it. They didn't. All of them got back to the British lines bar one who died. Wow. Um and those tanks, I mean the first of all tanks were so clunky and kind of they, they were, were brand new technology, weren't they? Heavy as fuck, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um like manual crank and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, and you yeah. couldn't speak to each other so there was hand signals and all that kind of shit. And then after that then they started making the features. And then it was so the first feature was Lancaster's guys that was we shot that 2015, 2016, released it twenty eighteen. And then there was Spitfire, so that was Lancaster Bomber Crew. Um, all war films. Then there was Spitfire over Berlin. I only had a small part in that one. Um, that was that was they did that one mostly in lockdown just to make something. Right, yeah. Yeah. So they had one guy in the spit. And then there was two or three ground crew, and I just played the ground crew just to mm. fill out the roles and stuff. And then the next one, Battle Over Britain, I play one of the principals. Yes, I've not managed to watch that yet. It's been released. You um, Why? Yeah, I know. You can't invite me onto a fucking podcast, but I don't know. Watch your latest film. Really. The research, yeah, yeah. I watched your previous work. Well, yeah, I'm not. I'm not ah, see, today. this is my best work. Yeah, I yeah. think so. Um, I just, I think the film was really good. It allowed, it allowed me to like they allowed me gratefully to be me. Yeah, and I allowed, uh, I allowed them to get what they needed out of me, mm-hmm. which is good. Um, there's a scene in it where I'm screaming, without any spoilers, like shit goes down bad shit happens yeah and i pick up a bell and i throw it yeah the scream is real yeah because i had a disc i'm not a disc show but i had a torn shoulder oh yeah and, I, and they said can you pick up that bell and throw it and i'm like my shoulder's a bit dodgy but yeah fine I pick up this fucking bell it's like 10 kilos <laughs> fucking yeet it across this field ah oh, mate if you watch it yeah i'm not acting that's real pain, pain is real that's your yeah. dicaprio moment of the cut hand <laughs> yeah right. yeah, yeah. It, <laughs> it's, it's like it's real pain it's vigo when he kicks the helmet Right, yeah, right, yeah, is that shit. Rings, yeah. Yeah, yeah, got you. Yeah. Well, I think um, you know at this point I'd like to kind of uh, because I, I'm so curious of like how you got into acting in the first place. I know you mentioned that you're a musician first yeah. and foremost uh, up front, which is uh, obviously a form of performance and acting. Yes, in a way, especially as a lead uh, front man. Uh, but can we go back to like you know uh, like your school days and like you know was it was there any kind of like drama classes or you know did you did you have that bug for acting early or was it more just for music at that point? Uh, neither. Neither. No, I was I was a sport. I'm still sporty now, um, but I was a sporty kid growing up. Yeah, I came from a sport family. My sister played for England. She was a goalkeeper really? for England. Yeah, oh, wow. football. Yeah, um, so she, so we were always playing football. We were always out on the field playing football or cricket or all that kind of stuff. Um, that it was in the school teams as like a primary school kid. I broke into the school teams as like halfway through high school, but then I got ill because I've got ME, um, oh, right. and I spent two. I spent year ten and eleven in. Uh, the school at hospital in Manchester. How does ME manifest itself? I don't really know much about it. <clears throat> it's sometimes a lot of pain. Sometimes it's mate. It's hard to explain. Sometimes it's a lot of pain. Sometimes it's a lot of fatigue for no reason. It's weird, mm-hmm. like mental fatigue as well. Yeah, and muscular pain. Um, it's it's a hard one to explain, diagnose. Is it a neurological thing? Is it a, to do with your brain? Or is it, what's it, how's um, it, how's it? No, it's like energy systems and stuff, oh, okay. I guess. I haven't yeah. been bad with it for a few years, like decades, I haven't been bad with it. So Can you medicate for that, or is it just something that Do you just... know what? I used to make sure I had a load of Q10. Maybe that's just an old school thing for it, but I just had to make sure I had uh, a load of Q10 and just, just keep moving. Yeah. I found if I just keep myself doing stuff, I forget that I'm yeah. tired and sore, mm-hmm. and I've just kept that work ethic all, all the way through yeah. my life. Yeah. So I'm grateful that I went through that at school. But no, I didn't, I wasn't interested in anything like that um, until I was probably 17, 18. Mm. I bought like an electric guitar from the Trafford Centre. Do you remember the Trafford Centre? There was like that 
village down at the bottom when it first I opened. I remember that so well. Mate, like, there was a music shop in there. there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's such a mad memory. Yeah, so, so I bought my first guitar from there. around it or something? Was it like a kind of... Um... It was like a little marketplace yeah, with yeah. tiny little food stalls and I guess like it's... I think it's where the... It's where Five Guys is now, I think. Yeah, it I was think. kind of ahead of its time in the way yeah. that, like, you know, that's kind of in now. That, yeah. Like, loads of little food stalls and so on, like, ultra and markets. But but then I remember it, and it, and it didn't last, did it? And then they built, like you say, I think they built... Um, they built something there. Might even be where? John Lewis. John Lewis? Yeah, it is. Yeah. John Lewis, isn't yeah. it? But no, I remember that, because yeah. they had these guitars on the stands, and obviously, as a kid, you love going up to guitar yeah. and strumming them. Yeah, yeah, like, playing, yeah. Yeah. Right. So, uh, yeah, so that's where I bought my first guitar. And then... <laughs> I love music before that. Like I've always been a metalhead. Yeah. Like my first single was Iron Maiden, Bring Your Daughter to the Slaughter. I nice. went to the shop and walked in to buy it. My mum was like, What the fuck are you buying? So it's, <laughs> I want this mum. You got Eddie on the Eddie's front. Eddie's on the front. Yeah. yeah. This is very appealing. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And when yeah. you when you're ten, when you're nine, ten, and your mum looks at it and goes, This is called Bring Your Daughter to the Slaughter. All right, fuck it. I'm grateful she let me buy it. <laughs> yeah. Because like as a parent, she could like can put it back you nutter yeah of course you know, as you would they yeah. can police that kind of stuff but you're gonna hate me but my first Iron Maiden single was Wildest Dreams so Wildest Dreams I would listen to Wildest Dreams on the way are you kidding nope. no way <laughs> wow. Yep. wow we're practically family yeah yeah that's crazy but no that was that's why I came to them late is my point anyway, then I was you know, good later but uh, yeah but, but you still came to them which I is good still got them yeah, yeah. <laughs> my, my lad loves Iron Maiden he's just one of my uncle's mates is um, graciously donated um, an original press of Number of the Beast and a 2010 tour shirt wow. to Cooper. Yeah. Um, so that's a shout out to Paul there. So I appreciate that. I, um, I, I can listen yeah. to Number of the Beast any day. I think it, it, it's one of those songs that I never, ever get tired of. Yeah. Like, I can just listen to it constantly. It is. It's a good album as well. Yeah. You know, like certain singles, like, you know, uh, Smells Like Teen Spirit or whatever song it is, you, do, yeah. you get a bit chop suey by system. Yeah, you yeah. get a little bit tired of it and you're kind of like, you know, you're not interested, but there's certain songs like that that I can just listen to it just, over and over. Yeah. yeah, I love it. So... Yeah, so from that era, Power Slave would be my album. That'd be my album. Yeah. Like Aces High and Two Minutes to Bin Night, stuff like that. Oh, awesome. I love that. I love riffing that out. I'm going to stop talking about music because I'm just going to rant. Because... Well, no, this is this is fascinating, though, because, like, you know, I always thought, find this with, with, with podcasts. We we often bring an actor on to talk to them about the film career, and you realise that it's not necessarily the only string to their bow. Um, but right. also, yeah. it comes to bear as well because it's kind of like... Um, I, I had a, a quite a similar period of transition to you where I kind of wanted to do nothing but music production and play in bands yeah. up to about 2008, 2009. And then we did our first film project at, um, at SSR, which is uh, which I believe you went to. I did, well. yeah. Yeah, you were at SSR as well. Older um, than you. I remember the old school building. Yes. In, yeah, uh, I was on Tara uh, Street in Manchester. You were Tara yeah, Street, yeah, yeah, the yeah. original crew. Yeah, and so we did our first film project and we were doing uh, Foley, we were doing you know dialogue replacement, all these techniques. And it was just my whole world just explode i remember thinking i can't believe this much goes into making yeah. a movie i was just so naive to that yeah so anyway so from that point onwards i i kind of turned and you know was like, i just want to do film i want to do film sound i want to do re-recording dialogue so on so on and boom operation and it sounds like for you it was a similar transition but into acting and uh, film production i guess to an extent as well um so yeah, can you mostly. tell me about that moment and why, why that transition know, yeah that transition from from being music focused to being acting focused do you know the simple, the simple thing is, I just thought I'm going to do it. Fuck it, I'm going to do it. That was it. it was but just where that. did the love come from? Was it yours, like movies? I've or... always loved movies. Yeah. yeah. So, like, the first film I saw at the cinema was the original Santa Claus, the movie with Dudley Moore and oh yeah, yeah, um, yeah. all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, and I remember it. I remember going to see it with my mum. And ever since then, I've like I love the cinema. Yeah. I go as much as possible. Um. And as a kid, I thought it'd be cool to like, oh, it'd be cool to one day like shoot aliens and stuff and like fight bad guys. Yeah. And but that was just a thought. I didn't, I didn't even think it would be the genesis of becoming an actor or anything like that. Mm. Um, and then you just kind of forget about it, and you just kind of enjoy films and TV as you as you're growing up and as yeah. you're becoming an adult. And I'm a musician, so my creative drive is being fulfilled. All those needs are being fulfilled, and I'm out with my mates and I'm tour in Europe and all that kind of stuff. And you're using your voice, you're a front man, so it's like, you know, you're, you're yeah. singing. You're, so that's a performance. To be, to, yeah, you know. yeah. As a front man, to be fair, I shared that with Steve. So yeah. we were front men together. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, but it's my songs that I'm singing. It's his songs that I'm singing. It's his songs that he's singing. It's my songs that he's singing. So we're all yeah. sharing that. So it's our voice that's going out there. Yeah. And we're putting our footprint on the world. Mm. Like we're putting our mark on the world. We know we're, that's our footprint. Um, but it, like 2008, I just fell out of love with it. Yeah, just I just fell out of love with music. Mm. I just thought I'm not. We were on tour in Germany, and the last second to last gig, I just said to Steve, "It's like, mate, I'm done. Let's do the gig. It. That was it. That was it. I was like, mate, I'm done." Mm. And then 
and to be fair, he was like, "That's coming." He, like the, he saw it coming. I think he realised. He he must have realised before I did. Mm. Um, I know I wasn't happy doing it. Mm. I wasn't um, disillusioned with it or anything. I was just I just all of a sudden just like, no, nope, that's enough. That's enough now. Yeah. I've done enough of this. Um, and he was like, all right, cool. Oh, well, thanks for telling me. And we finished the tour, and then I went. I came back for the ten year anniversary um, to do a gig with him. What was that 2014? So there was like a still a big six year gap from not yeah. doing anything. Um, the year after that, so 2008, um, I just started writing a zombie film because I love I've loved zombie films. I love The Evil Dead. Oh yeah, I'm a Romero that, guy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, all those kinds. Of, yeah, awesome. all that kind of stuff. Um, so I just started writing a comedy zombie film, and I thought, oh, I'm going to go and learn to be a writer and a director, so I can make the zombie film. No interest in being an actor, right? Yeah. Um, as I'm writing it, I start another band with my mates called The Meta. We sang about computer games. So we sang about Fallout 3, Halo. Um, <laughs> what was the other one? Left 4 Dead. Oh, brilliant. Yeah. Um, and like the soundtracks to those that I now use to my lads' uh, YouTube channel. So my lad's got a oh, YouTube gaming channel. Brilliant. So he's got the intro to one of the songs as it's, it's like a metal like just a metal riff I guess that's what got him into metal Yeah, maybe because yeah. like, oh daddy who wrote this it was me yeah. what <laughs> yeah. I like it yeah and then he got a guitar for Christmas and now he loves metal and all that's that great man that's really um, cool but yeah. yeah so I that lasted a year because just or mates just I guess I just needed to fill that gap that I'd, was that, that low maintenance it was kind of just mate we did three gigs like one in Bolton yeah. one at Academy 3 one somewhere else I can't remember but it, but it let you exercise that musical creative it was, energy it still. filled that hole that I it needed like to fill a, that I didn't realise it was realize. like a little swan song yeah, yeah to that I guess that's what it was yeah just, yeah just go and write different stuff and this was this was thrash this was prog thrash yeah um, and I was screaming as opposed to singing yeah so it was just it was totally different and it was nice hmm. um, but then 2009 like at this point I'd started going to acting school to learn how actors work so I could write and make this zombie film. So you still weren't thinking no. really about acting primarily. No, it was just like yeah. how can I make actors better and how can they make my film better? I need to go and understand how they work because I'm all about research. And I think that's where that work ethic that I've got comes in from when I was a kid and I was ill. Mm. Um that flowed over into writing because I was when I was a musician, I was working at the traffic centre at mm-hmm. Waterstones, and I was getting the 68 bus from, and I was living in Walkton, I was getting the 68 bus from Walkton to Eccles, then the 100 bus from Eccles to the traffic centre mm. to go to work with my guitar and my amp. Then I'd get the 100 back to Manchester, and then I'd get off in Manchester, I'd go and get the 216, fucking hell, you're getting history of the fucking buses in Manchester yeah, now. No, Sorry, it, everyone's yeah. boring as shit. <laughs> then you get the 216 to Ashton Underline, which is where we where rehearse. So I'm getting like, but then I've got two or three buses on the way back home as well. So I'm getting six buses a day, Jesus. going to work, going to rehearsal, and then coming home yeah. from rehearsal. All different fucking corners of Manchester. Mate, your clipper card was just like getting torn yeah, up. Mate, <laughs> mate, the amount of, That's the amount of money reference. I spent. Yeah, <laughs> clipper cards, Jesus Christ. The amount of money I spent on travel. Um, so that I've, I've always had that work ethic. Yeah. So, um, and that's now spilled over into the research that I do for roles and everything. So yeah. so that's the genus of that. Um, and as I was researching how to be an actor, I was like, oh, shit, acting is fun as fuck. Yeah. And I just stopped writing. Okay. And that, that was it. Yeah. Um, so I went to MSA. I started off at MSA in Manchester, so Manchester School of Acting. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, which is, it was on Ardwick Green. I don't know where it is now. I think it's off Deansgate now. Deansgate Locks now, I think. Mm. Um so I was there for three or four years. Met some people I'm still mates with. Met some people I still do stuff with. Met some people that um, I don't see anymore. Um, but here's still... one for Mike as well. Yeah, I went to MSA with Natalie Pike. And okay. Natalie Pike is City's presenter. Oh, really? Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. Michael, Michael, appreciate yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. No doubt. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I was just going to ask, like, in terms of... Because <clears throat> I, I know nothing about acting at mm. all. I've never studied it, never watched it being studied. I've never been to... I've, you know, I've been to a drama school maybe once to do some filming. My question is, like, when you're acting, are you still thinking about the techniques that you learned there? You know, is it is it like a sort of a, a way of, like, you know, you're still channeling those exact techniques you were taught, or is it all just kind of self-taught after the fact, if you know what I mean? Like, do you come up with your own techniques? Or Yeah, I think you have to, but I think that comes with experience, though. Yeah. And uh, do you know what, man? However many actors there are in the world, um, we can, and I'm, I'm going to refer this to jiu-jitsu because I fight, right? I'm a yeah. 
I'm a jiu-jitsu fighter. I fight all over the world in jiu-jitsu, believe it or not. Um, That's your primary martial art that you, you practice, is it? So it is now. Yep. Yeah, historically I've done um, Krav Maga, Jeet Kune Do, Taekwondo, mm. kickboxing. I teach karate to kids yeah. um, still. Um, but mine for me now, so I've stopped all the stand-up stuff. Uh, mine for me now is Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Right. And now I still go and compete. Um, and I love it. Um, and you could teach someone the same thing. You could teach someone an armbar. Mm. You could teach someone a rear naked choke, or you could teach someone how to take someone on a pass guard. And you could teach 400 people the same thing, the same way. We would all do it differently. Right, yeah. So, and the yeah. same applies to acting, right? Mm. You learn how to break down a script a specific way, mm. but actually, like Bruce Lee said, going back to martial arts, take what you need, discard what you don't. Right. Because if I'm keeping on what I don't need or what doesn't work for me, like discard what doesn't work for you. Mm. If I if I don't discard what doesn't work, I'm wasting my time. It's just baggage. I'm wasting my energy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't need it. It's information I don't need. Yeah. So you learn more through experience, but I am not arrogant enough to think that I've learned I've learned it all myself. Yeah, yeah. I am competent now because of the lessons I've had. Yeah. And I've been I think what makes a good actor better is being cognizant enough to understand that you it's just a blueprint. Yeah. You don't need to be so rigid to it. Just be your fucking self. Like you yeah. do you and that's enough. Yeah. Right? Um I watch actors and sometimes I was watching something last night um with Emily, my girlfriend, and I said, He's amazing, she's awful. This was high level stuff. And at the end of the day, that's just my fucking opinion. Mm. Someone might think she's amazing, he's awful. Yeah. Someone might think they're both awful or they're both amazing. It doesn't yeah. matter, right? Someone might think they're just average. Yeah. It's just, I am one eight billionth of the world's opinion. Yeah. And but that's, however, that is your opinion and that's yeah. the way you perceive it. And that's my world. reality. Yeah. yeah. In the same way, some people will look at me and go, Vin's amazing or Vin's garbage. Some people just don't get stuff, right? Yeah. And that's fine. But taking those blueprints, I have realized that I don't need to keep a hold of everything. Mm. What I do need to use, however, is myself yeah. and everything I've been through. As It's kind of like use it as tackling fuel. You know, like Bobby Boucher in, yeah, yeah, in Waterboy. Yeah, yeah. Tackling fuel. Um, <laughs> I love the way he repeats it. Tackling fuel. Tackling fuel. <laughs> I love that movie. Yeah. So if you can imagine, when I'm on set, yeah. everyone is just shouting at me, water sucks. Yeah, That's yeah. exactly what it is. <laughs> Um, but I mean, I suppose um, also correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the the mood on the set and the director will set a tone as well. So, for example, there'll be some sets that are more relaxed and some sets that are way more kind of I don't know. Perhaps you you, you change your attitude a bit towards that, or do you just try and remain the same? I, the the mo I used to try and be fluid with who I was um, and appease people where they needed appeasing. Now I don't give a fuck. I'm just me. Yeah, because I'm, I swear a lot, mm. and I'm quite from footed, but I'm a but my nice dude. Yeah, and I think people would appreciate. And my jujitsu coach become one of my good friends. Um, Damien said to me, like a couple of years ago, I lost my way a little bit, and I, I tried to. Like you go through bad phases in your life, and oh, yeah. I tried to get stuff back, and he's like, "I miss the old Vinny." Like, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, he was like, "I miss the old Vinny." Um, like you, you stop pleasing people. Mm. Like you, you had an opinion and you said it, mm. but you know you said it respectfully, and I preferred that. Yeah. Um. Not nobody's perfect. Mm. I'm sure that I will lose myself again at some point, and I'll mm. catch myself again. Um. But I found that if you're just a good dude, don't be a dick. Work hard, mm. and respect everyone and everything that's there. Mm. You don't have to please people. No. Because not everyone's going to like you, and that's okay. Yeah. And David Bowie said, and I realized this when I was 40, David Bowie said, um, turning 40, you, and I'm paraphrasing, you turn into the person that you were always meant to be. I, t I, think, I think that's totally true. Because at that point, you yeah. realize, like, where you've come from, who you are, everything starts to sink in. Yeah, your ego you mature starts enough. to diminish, and you're please like you say your people please and goes i think mine's kind of on its way out and i'm very Good. pleased because i i was i was very very timid growing up and sort of like oh really, i was a coward my mum fought all my battles for me oh really yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. So, was I. so you had to kind yeah. of work past that I, i'm yeah. totally so well i just i just avoided conflict at Same. all costs and yeah. um and you know what's interesting i i didn't for a bit mm. where i started getting a bit stronger a bit more sure of myself but martial arts has allowed me to re-avoid conflict 
yeah, in okay. a different way. In a different way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Don't need to. Now it's about discipline and respect. And respect is a bit, respect and time is my currency. Yeah. You could pay me minimum wage through a film. Mm. I'm forever. Yeah. I'm cool with that. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't. People yeah. don't need to be. People don't need to know who Vin Hawke is, mm. but Vin Hawke needs to make stuff. Yeah. That's it. It's as simple as that. I, I, yeah. I totally agree with you. I think that, you know, it's, it, I've always, what I'm quite pleased and proud of myself for is this, this podcast has always been, I love doing this. I'll Good. do this no matter what. Do you know what I mean? Like no matter yeah, how man. many views we get, no matter what guests we get, you know, we've been very lucky to get good guests. Uh, but you know, it's, it's really, I would be doing this. You anyway. can smile at me when you say that, you know. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't look. At it. I looked away when I said it. Yeah, <laughs> but, uh, but no. Um, yeah. So and and I think fifteen years ago, ten years ago, that wouldn't have been the case. No, you would have been trying I mean? to tick every box, please everyone, make get as many views as possible. Exactly. Yeah. Like yeah. if if someone's in acting school now, like if for some reason they've seen because like you saw me on the terror right yes yeah that's when <laughs> um, i uh, i re i re-recognized you yeah which is mental <laughs> yeah. um we'll come to that in a minute yeah, that's an interesting okay. story um so whether you're working with like because that was with i was my favorite bit of my whole career is i've got two favorite bits it's being able to now be myself mm-hmm. and be proud of that but aside from that my favorite bit of my whole career is on the terror wasn't filming the terror, wasn't making it, which was great. It was sat around at lunchtime with Jared Harris mm. and Tobias Menzies and Kieran Hines talking about, and it was me and Jared mostly taking over the conversation for one day, talking about how much we love Star Trek. Yeah. That was yeah, it, yeah, just yeah. at lunchtime, and that's my favourite thing. Yeah. Um, and he realised, oh, shit. And I'm like, fuck, it's Jared Harris. Why am I fucking talking about Star Trek? And I was asking yeah. him about it, because he's in The Expanse, right? Yeah. And I was asking him about season two, because I hadn't seen it at that point. Um, and I was like, so what happens in season two? And he's like, oh, well, this stuff, this. <laughs> so, Jared, do you like sci-fi? I said, yeah, I'm a big Trek. He's like, fucking yes, yeah, let's go. Yeah. So, and the, but he loves, and I like Big Bang Theory, so we're talking about Star Trek, the Big Bang Theory. Yeah. So, and I'm just like, I'm starstruck, right? Yeah. We're on the same project. Like, we're not being paid the same wage, obviously. Mm. Um, I'm this little, I'm there for like two episodes. He's there for the whole, like the whole season. Yeah. Um, but I'm like, oh shit, this is ace. What a remarkable show to be a part of. And I think that, you know, I, I mean, I, I watched The Terror and it, it, it not, not to, you know, to sort of uh, to not say it too obviously, but it really scared me, really yeah. terrified me. I think that there's, um, there's something about that story and then adding the supernatural element to it, which is so smart and so clever because it can never really be known what happened to these men fully. So therefore, why not embellish a little bit on there? Yeah. However, keeping it so real. So for, for the people who uh, haven't seen the series, could you just give it a little uh, summary for us? Because it is, it's absolutely fantastic. Yeah, basically. So in the 1800s, the British Admiralty wanted a route to China to get to get a quicker route so they didn't have to circumnavigate under Africa and all that kind of shit so they could establish trade routes and grow the kingdom basically grow the empire um, and then they thought fuck it let's just go let's go through the Arctic because it's quicker and just go over instead of going down and under so they they repurposed two battleships um, the Erebus and the Terror I'm, I th- I'm sure they were battleships anyway they were big yeah, ass ships right, right yeah, yeah. Um, so the, Admiral, the Admiralty repurposed two ships crewed it with experienced like high level high level crew um experienced captains and officers some some non coms as well that had never never been there um and they decided right we're going through the arctic so the erebus and the terror of the two ships basically they get landlocked um in up towards nova scotia up towards canada um they get iced in and they all perish and they'll die yeah in real life from hypothermia from lead poisoning from the what they lined the tins with. I heard that. That's yeah, so tragic, grim, isn't it? They, they, they had no chance like, from the start, really. Oh, you know, being no. poisoned uh, no. slowly by the food, yeah. But then there, w- there, there would have been and there must have been some um, connection, not connection, some interaction with the indigenous people yeah. at that point. That's the story. And yeah. literally they found the wreckage of the Erebus the year the terror came out in 2018, which is interesting. It's really interesting. And, and it's rotting, they, so there's there's a time frame now. Yeah. So yeah. they need to get as much out of it as possible. They've not raised it, they've just, they they, can't. They're just diving on it. it so, yeah, 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 they've rotted it. So what happened was, in 2006, a uh, horror novelist took the idea and thought, why don't we create the fact that they all died? Maybe, maybe it wasn't hypothermia and lead poison, maybe it was spiritual. Mm. So he writes in that one of the indigenous peoples comes on board I can't remember if he's attacked or not, and he dies on the ship. Mm. And because he doesn't die 
in view of the stars, he dies in, in inside the belly of the ship. It releases the spirit of the Tunbak, which is half polar bear, half god spirit from local legend to come and gain vengeance on the people who did it who oh, took that soul invaders. from him basically yeah. Invaders, yeah. yeah and uh, and it becomes the supernatural hunt of this unseen polar bear predator slash demon yeah. who's coming to get you it's interesting i i love that take on it because um you know the the, the, the the what's what's great about it is the story is fascinating on its own yeah without any supernatural even without element. that bit yeah exactly and there's so much mystery surrounding what exactly happened to these men and and so on they, there was um on the rescue missions i believe that they found uh several grave sites yes yeah uh, of, uh, and they allude to that in the show as well yeah, yeah, yeah. that's actually uh, depicted and they, they yeah. um <clears throat> but also they found uh, human remains with evidence of uh, cannibalism. Cannibalism, so yep. carving on the bones and, yep. and so on. So they knew that these guys got into the most desperate, dire straits, and, and most likely resorted to cannibalism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, and there was no survivors. That's correct, isn't it? Well, well, we don't know. We don't know. No. For sure. And as the show says, well, well, maybe there was. Yeah. Maybe there wasn't. Um, yeah. If you've seen the show, you'll know what I mean. Um, Sorry, hashtag spoilers. I just have to uh, tell a very self-indulgent story just for a moment because it. it really got into my psyche, uh, this show. And one, one of the reasons is, not just because it's brilliantly acted and it's a great, great show and a great story. These are the episodes I'm not in, yeah? Yeah, yeah all the ones cool. you're not yeah, in. Sweet. Yeah, the ones I really liked. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, I feel scared now. <laughs> I'm in trouble. This guy knows jujitsu, man. Um yeah, uh, basically, when I was a kid, you might have even seen these, but these eyewitness books that they had, uh, where they had, they, they, was, they were sort of uh, kids' encyclopedia books. I think so. I think I know what you mean. Yeah, and they were like large hardback books you'd see in the library, and you'd open them. And oh, have, yeah, yeah. You know, they'd have one on Egypt, they'd have one yes, on I know Romans, what whatever, all these yeah, kind yeah. of you know, simplistic kids' sort of subjects. Yeah. But the, there was one that was on mummies. Right, right. So they, there was so you know. I mean, it's so fucked up to think like in the library, I could just open a book and look at dead bodies. Yep. that's what that book is essentially. Yep. You know, was was, was, was yep. interesting. And the frozen mummy books and all that kind of stuff. Right. Is that what you're getting at? So I there was this. You know, when you you're scared as a kid and you skip over a page because yeah. it scares you. The image. Yeah. I used the, to be like that with sharks. With sharks. Anything in yeah. the water, I'm like no, fuck, that. fuck yeah. it, fuck it. Done with that. Yeah. <laughs> so I had that with this one image of um, a frozen mummy. That was um, it was sort of grinning. It's had that feral. I know exactly of, the picture that you, you mean. Know, I know exactly. Course, is, yeah. is, is it one of the Shackleton ones where they found bodies and stuff? It yeah, would have been that one. In, yeah, it's the, it's basically related to the terror mission. I think. Um, oh, was it? Well, I think on that page there was several. There might have been one of those. But this was actually specifically related Holy to shit. the terror mission. Well, okay. I didn't know this at the time. Obviously. Right? No, no, of course. Because yeah. I'm not reading that things. I'm just looking. Yeah, at the yeah. And so this man who is frozen in time essentially because he's fate he's still got all the flesh on his skin, his teeth are kind of a little bit of a beard and stuff as well. Beard, yes, yeah, you yeah. know, he's like two hundred years old at this yep. point, this 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 mummy. That I hated that image and I skipped over it, it scared me to death because it was just a horrible fucking image of a dead yep. body. Yeah. Uh, which is a, quite a natural reaction, I think. Uh, anyway, so years, you know, twenty years later, when I watched the terror, yep. there's a scene where they're burying the first uh, couple of people who, yep. di- who died on the ship uh, from infection and poisoning and so on. And something in my psyche goes, I know that guy. You know, the, the image of him yeah. wrapped in the shroud yeah, and yeah, the yeah. way he was uh, wrapped and so on, his head- headdressing on. And there was something in my soul that got scared because I was like, I know that image. It's freaking me out. Yeah. And then anyway, so, you know, I did a little bit of research and uh, they do the burial scene and so on. And I thought, oh, that's really just unsettled me. So I did the research and I found the same image and I realized it's that guy. So no what way. they've done is they've recreated you know, that nice. image so well that it freaked me. The, yeah. It really freaked me the F out. That's really cool. So anyway, um, so that put me on a good horror footing with the show because I was like, I'm already actually terrified. So how did you get involved with the terror? Uh, my agent at the time. Yeah. That was it. So I'd... At that point, I'd got just got a new it, so I'd come off. I hadn't come off the back of like I'd done a TV show called The Last Days of. I've, I, I do a lot of historical stuff for some reason. Yeah. I don't know why, right? Um, and I'd come off the back of a TV show called The Last Days of X, and it was very. It was like an anthology where one day it was Jesus, one day it was mine was Charles the First and all that kind of stuff. So I yeah. played the prosecutor in the Charles the First episode, um, and then this my agent at the time who got me that. She was also casting director for a lot of American B movies that shot in Wales because she was based in Bangor. And I was like, all right, cool. So you do a lot of. You've heard of The Asylum, the guys that do the B movies yeah, of yeah. like just the, the takes on like 
the Terminators, they'll do like the Exterminators. It's, yeah, it's that kind of stuff, right? Sort of the uh, pound shop version. Exactly, yeah. yeah sure. So one of the producers and one of the directors was coming over to make a film. Um, so it's a producer from the asylum doing his own thing and a director called Mark Lester. And Mark Lester did Commando. Oh, and I'm nice. like, fuck yeah. Like, <laughs> I knew can I recognize that. Yeah, yeah. He did like um, Five Star. I'm sure he did Five Star. Uh, class 1984 and all that kind of stuff as well. Oh, right, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, so I was like, fuck, I need to, like, can, can I read for this? Can, and it was uh, based on um, Camelot, mm. like King Arthur and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I was coming off that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, but it was a, a time to step up, so I changed my agent. Mm. Um so I did I did like the B movie, did that T V show. I was like, right, let's change my agent, let's go with someone down in London because mm. there's more opportunities than in North Wales. Sure. Just found myself in North Wales for a bit. Um so that agent within the first three or four months managed to get me a commercial, which is great. A couple of weeks after that he goes, Um, I've got a self tape for you for this show called the Terry, you have to sign an NDA for the self tape. And I'm like all right, so it's a pretty big deal. I was like, yeah, that's cool. Wow. So I'd read for a role called, do you know Mr. Weeks mm. in The Terror? So I read for Mr. Weeks. Um, that went to a gent called um, uh, Gordon, um, who is awesome, from Dundee, top bloke, top actor, amazing, perfect for the role. Mm. Um, but they got back to me and said, we want to offer you um, George Barrow. Yeah. Which was cool. So I did episode one, um, had this expositional scene with um, Tobias and uh, David, who plays my father in the film, uh, in the in the TV show. Um, and it was, it turns out it was just edited out mm. for time or maybe I was shit. I don't think it was shit for reasons I'll tell you in a minute. <laughs> Mate, if it was shit, I was shit. Is what you made it the got, cut, so. Got I taken out for right. reasons. Well, yeah, well yeah. at the end of episode one, I do this. You do a little... I'm clapping at the end yeah. in the opera house, but that was a whole scene that explains the point of the journey. Right. That that is um, that that lays it all out, and that had gone. Um, but they were watching the rushes, um, and Ridley Scott's watching all the dailies. Yeah. By the way, because it's Scott Free. Yeah. Yeah. And they say Ridley's watching all the dailies. And no like, pressure. Right. <laughs> and I'm like, if I'm that shit, Ridley wouldn't have got me back. Yeah. But it wasn't Ridley that got me back. It was the showrunner David Kaganick. Mm. Um. And Sue, uh, the other sh- the other showrunner, um, like she was amazing as well, as well as David. And David is, I can't remember what he's working on at the minute, but he's working on good. He'd tried to get the terror made since like 2006. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah, he'd been, like Netflix had picked it up. I think HBO had picked it up and dropped it. And then AMC picked it up and they'd released it originally through BT. Right. And then it went to Prime and then it went to BBC right. and stuff. So, um, But yeah, so David had been attached to it for ages and he'd taken the book to script he'd taken the novel to screen um, uh, so David who was super friendly was like we've got the scene we need to shoot who can, who do we need Vin Yeah, we'll grab Vin let's get Vin back so I'm back in it for episode 10 Yeah. Um, so I did a couple of episodes and Jamie my agent rings me for that again and he goes Vin they want you back for episode 10 I was like what really it's like but I'm done it's like yeah no they've they've expanded it which is good I'm like to be invited back and expanded yeah. is nice. It's lovely. Yeah. There must be other yeah. reasons behind it. <laughs> but if it was shit, they won't get me back. Yeah. <laughs> if it, but here's the main thing. If it was a dick, they wouldn't have... As good as I am, if it was a dick and they couldn't work with me, they won't get me back. Yeah. Which yeah. Pro- which plays into my theory of don't be a dick, just be all right. When you, when you go to a, a production like the Terror, like, you know, do you see that discipline amongst the actors? Do you, do you, do you feel there's this, just this universal... You know, everyone is just a good, a good person, a good actor. Well, you know, in terms of, do you know what? Mostly, discipline. mostly, yeah. Mostly, yeah. Everyone is usually super, super friendly. Yeah. Um, it is very, very rare, and I've come across them like one or two. In how long have I been been doing this now? Like seventeen years now mm-hmm. as an actor. Two thousand eight, sixteen years. Um, working on set for fifteen, sixteen years. Yeah. Um, mo like one or two people, I wouldn't like. I would throw myself into a volcano if they were tied to me just to make sure they died as well. Right. <laughs> like, that's what I think of these people. That, that but bad, it's yeah. fucking rare, right? Very everyone rare. Everyone is yeah. super friendly. That's good to know. And on a production like that, everyone's on it. Yeah. Because yeah. it's AAA, right? Yeah. You're talking like millions an episode. Yeah. Hundreds of thousands an episode. Yeah, yeah. Um, but what's interesting is, like I was saying before, we were just talking about Star Trek, it was 
in between takes. They're just there looking around at this opera house in Budapest where we shot. So that was a location? That was a location for one of them, yeah. Wow. So on one of our locations was the opera house in Budapest. And like Tobias and Kieran are looking around going, and um, Jared looking around going, isn't this, what? This is a crazy location. And I'm going and going, this is a crazy location. And I'm thinking, fuck, they're doing that as well. Yeah, yeah, they're yeah. Just, everyone's a normal person and we forget yeah. that. Mm-hmm. We forget that. Everyone comes out of a womb. Yeah. Everyone comes out of a vagina. Yeah. Everyone needs to breathe and drink and eat. Yeah. Everyone shits. Yeah. Everyone pee. Everyone pees. Yeah. Right. I don't know why I said pees and not pisses because I said shits. Right. Pees, yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's a bit Whatever. of an Americanism, but we'll yeah. go. We'll, we'll leave that. <laughs> yeah. But but what you're saying is that people these, are people, man. These guys are actors. They look like they should be in an opera house because they're dressed like yeah. such and they're experienced actors. Yeah. But they're still impressed because they don't hang out in opera houses no. every day. So they're impressed by the yeah. locations as much as you are. Yeah. Though. They hang. Yeah. They hang around in the same place I hang around, which is like a room that's been rented to rehearse in. Yeah. It's the same fucking it's thing, new right? To everyone. No. Yeah. yeah. They live in a bigger house than I do, and. Yeah. Yeah, doesn't yeah. mean that doesn't mean they're a bad person. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but on when it, that was the first block that was in Budapest, they'd had built um, there's a studio in Budapest in the hills where they'd built the ship, where they'd built the terror, where they'd built the Erebus, um, and where they'd built all the effects and stuff. So they shot all those sections were in a studio mm-hmm. in Budapest. In episode ten, in my scene where I'm in the house, that was in a stately home in, yeah. in a suburb of Budapest. Um, and when when they got me back to shoot that bit. My agent Jamie rang me and said, They want you back for episode 10. I was like, Oh shit, I haven't, I've signed off. And I said, I asked them, Can I get my hair cut? Can I shave? And they said, Yeah. And he was like, Don't worry about it, just go. Mm. I was like, Oh shit, right, when do they want me? Are you planes leaving at nine in the morning? I was like, Oh Bro, fuck. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I text the producer um, and I said, Mate, I'm coming back. I don't have any of this stuff. And the producer's like, Fuck it, mate, just get on the plane. Yeah. I'll get it. And so they just put, for the second episode, for the, for the second episode I did, episode 10, they put a wig on me and. Um, they just assumed like oh he's had a shave it, whatever yeah. <laughs> and it was awesome so um, well, I've had to stop you there because I think what really struck me in that scene was just how good not your perf- only your performance but your accent was uh, that's why when I saw it I didn't really know if I knew you or not right because it was such a good performance oh thank you mate such a good accent so uh, it, does that come naturally to you doing the accent stuff or did you really have to work on that I I, I I don't think anything comes naturally to anyone. Mm. This is my opinion. I could be talking sh- fucking shit. I think people work on things without realising it. Mm-hmm. I think people practice things without realising it. Yeah. My accent work comes easy to me because I practice the fuck out of them. Mm. Um, so if I'm... Well, one of my favourite films is Goon. We need to talk yeah, about that, sure. right? Um, one of my favourite films is a Goon. Um, and I can just pull out a Canadian accent. Because like when... Um, Liv Schreiber's talking to Sean William Scott in it, mm-hmm. and he's saying, kid, you come at me, I will knock you the fuck out. Yeah. Right? I love all that kind of shit. So I, if I see a cool line, I'll just say that line over and over and over again. Yeah. Um, with the terror, because I had to be so proper. Mm. And I don't know if you've noticed this, but I don't speak with an RP accent, right? Um, and it's fucking hard for me to do. Yeah. Um, but accent is repetition, mouth shape, and... There are a few nuances to it as well. There's a few like posture and how you hold yourself and how you breathe and all that kind of stuff. Um, but I, if I do something well, it's because I've worked hard to make it good. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think talent is talent is earned, but you don't keep it. Mm. On if it's we a look, discipline. yeah. If we look at a ladder, right? I am as good as I am at any one thing. Some things will be higher up that ladder. Like I'm an alright footballer. Let's say on a ladder of one to ten rungs, my football is four. Yeah. Right. Man, I don't I don't play. My guitar is six because mm-hmm. I don't play as much anymore. My acting, on my scale, let's say my acting is seven. Mm-hmm. If I don't do any more acting ever again, that will slowly reduce to six yeah. to five to four. If I keep making myself better, I might get to halfway up six, yeah. halfway up seven. Um. So talent is an illusion. I hate the word talent mm-hmm. because talent isn't the absolute. Mm-hmm. Talent is the result of what you, of of how much you've put into where you need to be. Mm-hmm. Um, as douchey as fuck as that sounds, I think you have to invest in the discipline to be able to be good enough at it. That is absolutely true. Yeah, I joined um, a metal band in two thousand and eight, um, and the players in that band it was a prog metal band, and it wasn't really my 
favorite type of music. It was like sixth and um, yeah, I know Dream what you mean. Theater. I like Dream yeah. Theater, but you know, it was very, very prog. Okay, so let's talk about Dream Theater. Very complex. Yeah, <laughs> you've heard of them. Why? <laughs> <laughs> I love metal. I just don't get Dream Theater. Like no, Coheed and Cambria, Dream Theater. Fucking no. Get it's that, not for you. They yeah. can be tied into that volcano with me. I'll jump in. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah it, I get it, the appeal. I just don't get it. I, I, there's no excuse for Dream Theater. I just like it. Yeah, it's one of those things. But, that's but it. I'm aware that it's cheesy as fuck and like, and the dance, you know, the, the, the You don't have to justify of, it. No, but no, yeah. I'm aware, you know, I, I'm one of these people where I know metal is, is, is essentially a ridiculous thing because of the way it's presented, but I love it. Yeah. Do you good. know what I mean? I'm, yeah. I'm aware of that. Anyway. I'm just but, taking the piss out of you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but even, even two metalheads like you and me talking, we yeah, can yeah. still take the, we can still like, fuck no. Oh, well, people don't know about the subgenres, man. Exactly. Like, you know, like, so these guys that I was in the band with, uh, they, they, you know, hate it like thrash and right I secretly i fucking love tell thrash. Them that. it's yeah, my yeah. favorite yeah, yeah so i'm in so point being that i'm in this prog band so the right. music is way far advanced to what super I'm, technical super they're playing technical. in like six slash 17 time signatures and stuff yeah. and I'm, if i did that i'd be like what the fuck is this yeah i feel so like I I'm, to my brain's that. gonna be sick i yeah, had yeah. to learn all that shit and i was kind of just doing it by the seat of my pants right like doing it however the point being two years in that band and my playing was better than it'd ever have to be to play thrash yeah but it was good because i was almost like a, a beyond the abilities of the genre that I like. True, you know what I'm but that's because you were forcing yourself to be better. Right. You were putting yeah. yourself, you were doing things that made you better. Yeah. And that had a, that had a byproduct of making you better in, in your genre. Yes. Yeah. It's like, yeah, it's like I was sort of setting the, the bars too high. So yeah. I was like, going beyond. anyway, so I get, Everyone I get that sentiment. Yeah. Yeah, well, absolutely. that's the same with accents as well. Like if I'm learning an American accent, I'll deliberately over, you over utilize the R, the role of the R. Right. Because with acting, when I'm acting, you don't want to see me act. Mm. You want to see a person on screen. Yeah, this is where I get douche as fuck with my acting it information. No, it's true. Though. So, yeah, yeah. if 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 someone who's wants to get into acting or whatever listens to this podcast for some fucking reason, uh, <laughs> 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 listen. <no> <laughs> So when I listen back to this and I listen to myself, yep. yeah, they're not even plugged so in. So when you, mics. me, and Mike listen to it in a bit, yeah, yes, we all yeah. listen to it. Uh, they're not even plugged in. <laughs> yeah. okay, that red light's just that's the fire light. Yeah, yeah, that's the fire alarm. Yeah. I thought it was getting warmer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Up. Um So what I would say is, and I, and this is from like we were saying before, you learn this through experience. You you can't be taught this. And I was drilled. Oh yeah, you can be taught it, but what you can, you can be given the blueprint. You can't be forced to learn it. You have to. You have to learn it yourself through being shit and being mm. average and, and doing it wrong, and being by numbers. I think the best actors don't go by the numbers. Mm. Research can go by the numbers because you have to. I have to understand that bit and understand that bit. Once I've researched, I can fucking throw it away mm. because I'm a person. Like I don't know what you're going to say in the next question. Yeah. You don't know where I'm going to go with this tangent. It's organic, and that's what life is, right? Yeah. I'm going to stumble over a word. I'm going to go on a fucking mad tangent. I'm not going to say like go Pacino and deliver this monologue. Mm. You don't need to do that. Um, There's a certain amount of spontaneity, do you think? But, um, yes, but in demeanour mm-hmm. and in in inside yourself as opposed to in the words. Respect yeah. the words because I'm not a writer. I'm an actor. I have to respect what... Let's say we, we're talking about Callum and Andy Byrne again. I have to respect Callum's words. Yeah. If we're talking about the terror, I have to respect David Kagenick's words mm. and all that kind of stuff, right? So... Um, I have to do. I have to be precise with the prep, and I have to overwork the prep. So when I come onto screen, when I come on set, and I'm, and and I hear action, I can throw it all away. Yes. And I'm a person. Mm. It's me with a different accent, but I don't need to focus on the accent. Yeah. The amount of times I see people and actors, high level, low level, everywhere, focusing on an accent or delivering something in a specific way, and it's so mm. precise. And my coaches, Mark Mark Hudson at MSA, he said, "Stop acting." To everyone, don't act, don't act like a policeman. And I didn't understand that until three or four years after I'd left. Makes sense now. Mm. Policemen are people, yeah. Depends how fascist that policeman is, yeah. yeah but yeah. that's another story, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know what you mean, though. Like, don't act like what you perceive a policeman to be, and, yeah. You know, don't like you know, exactly what's all this. Then it's not about that, it's about being bringing out the human side, exactly. I, I think that, um. The certain performances, like you said, where it really is so naturalistic. Like the example I always go to is Ian Home in Alien. 
Yes. Uh, you know, Ian Holm and everything. In, in everything, but yeah. it, especially in Alien. When, when he's reading those lines, I'm just like, you're you're so good in this yeah. that you're just, I just believe you. There's nothing yeah. about you that seems like he's acting. And the same with Charles Dance. I'm a huge fan of Charles, yeah, Dance. Charles Dance. Alien 3, for example. Yeah. Uh, you can tell I'm an Alien fan. I fucking love Alien. Yeah, I love the whole, the whole thing. Yeah. One um, of my go-to skins on Fortnite, because I'm a massive gamer, is the Xenomorph and Ripley. Oh, nice. Yeah. <laughs> you get a Ripley skin on Yeah, that. yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> but no, I get the... <clears throat> I get what you're saying. It's almost like, and there was there was another example that I thought of when you were talking, which was um, William Friedkin, who directed The Exorcist, said that they rehearsed The Exorcist on a soundstage for three weeks, right? And then when they got to set, he said, "Right, forget everything mm-hmm. we've done. Like, remember the dialogue. Mm-hmm. Obviously, it's, it's in there. Yeah. But like he said, like you, you, you pull it from experience. Yeah. Yeah. Just, yeah, yeah. just do shit. Do just do life, do and life. we'll record it because it's so in. Yeah. Werner Herzog. So that's why, I like, Mads Mikkelsen. And Callum Keith Rennie, who's in The Goon. Oh, he's in The Goon too. He's in the sequel to The Goon. Um, but Callum Keith Rennie, Mads Mikkelsen, peop- actors like that, they don't do anything. No. They don't act. No. They exist. They just are. You don't want... I don't I don't want to be very, very aware of watching an actor. Mm-hmm. I want to be very, very aware that I'm invested. Yeah. Um, so Mark Hudson at MSA dropped that nugget. And then after a while, I went back to DNA. I went to Darren Gordon at DNA for a bit. This is after The Terror. Mm. And I thought, right, I've done The Terror... I want to. I want to make myself even better. Um, so I went to. I went to DNA, um, and my first session with Darren in the class, he was like, "I was very precise," and I said, "Oh, thanks, mate." And then I came back and I was like, "Oh shit!" Mm. Very precise means I've just acted the fuck out of it and I've planned it. Right. That is not me. That's not organic. Mm. That I'm acting. I don't want to act. So um, those nuggets from Mark and Darren have allowed me to be more fluent and more free and 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 more myself. Um, but even Werner Herzog said, don't go to film school to learn how to be a filmmaker. Mm-hmm. You're not going to learn how to be a filmmaker in film school. You're going to learn how to turn the camera on. Yeah. You'll be, you'll be a good director when you understand people yeah. and life. Yeah. Do life and then make a film. Yeah. And again, I'm paraphrasing, but I, yeah, I get the same. It's experience. Yeah. So Vin, uh, we ask our guests to bring uh, a film to the table to discuss. Uh, it might be something, might be a favorite film. It might be something obscure, like whatever. We'll let you uh, justify the movie, but it's uh, 2011's Goon, yeah. starring Sean William Scott. Uh, could you just tell us a little bit about this film and, uh, and why you brought it? Yeah, I brought it because you wouldn't allow me to have Back to the Future because you've done it. <laughs> Sorry, and it, it, oh, I said Mean Girls as well, didn't I? You did. I mean thought Girls. that was a joke. No, 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 no not okay, at all. Yeah. Mean Girls is one of the <laughs> fucking great films of all time. Awesome. Um, that the OG Mean Girls, not the new one. Yeah, yeah. Um, right. So I've always loved hockey. I love ice hockey. Always have done. Like I was a um, season ticket holder at OG Manchester Storm in the arena. OG I Manchester saw Storm. Them once. Yeah, yeah. yeah amazing. Um, and now, so I've got a, I've got a crew. I've got my own team, like myself, Liam Swan, who's a writer for like Kids TV, Netflix, and BBC, and all that kind of stuff. All of those really good. Um, and Joe McDonald. There's three of us. We've got like a little core production team. So performance side, writing side, and um, DP side. So cinematography side. Um, um, we're working on getting some hockey projects off the ground anyway. And Liam loves, loves hockey, but I've always loved hockey. And what I like about the goon is that it's, it's a far take from the Sean William Scott that, you know, cause he's not playing this. Yes. He's a goofy character, but he's not like, like you said before, he's not a stifler. Yeah. And he's not this all American hero type character that he might be in, um, you know, some, because the way he looks, he's what well, <laughs> the goon, is unashamedly what it is. Hmm. And it's hard to explain. It how how well do you know Jay Baruchel? I've never heard. So he's the voice of Hiccup on How to Train Your Dragon. You'll know him if you oh, see him. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um so he's in it as well. And yeah. there's just just lo- the swearing for no reason. Hmm. Um it's blue collar as fuck. Yeah. And Sean William Scott's character, he's a little bit on the slow side. Hmm. He he doesn't really understand like maths or English. He's a doorman. Yeah. Um his like me, his currency is respect and time. Yeah. So he will respect you and he will respect where he is and who he works for. Mm. Um simple, not in terms of stupid, just simple. Yeah. Just a, some, I, I love the fact that he apologizes before he beats someone up. Yeah, if he feels, exactly. Especially it's if respect. He feels like it's unjust. Yeah, unjust or whatever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but he's doing his job because he respects the jersey and he respects his opponent. Yeah. Um, I think what when I watched the goon, it just made me think that's everything a film should be, mm. because it doesn't 
pander to anyone. Mm. It doesn't try to be anything it's not. It's just a fun, it's just an ice hockey film yeah. about a hardworking guy who is doing his best to survive and finds his own family. Mm. Like, his family are supportive. Like, his, his mother and father love him, his, but they don't understand why he goes to play hockey. Yeah. Like, well-to-do, like, Jewish family type thing. Um, and then he is this brutal goon who finds yeah. him. He can't skate, really. No. But he's got heart. It's kind of like Rocky. It's like kind of like Ice Hockey Rocky. Yeah, Ice Hockey Rocky. But yeah. um, <laughs> with a bit of a, a humour twist on it. Uh, via Waterboy. Kind of, it's got yeah. Like this Waterboy kind yeah, of it's that, it's that it. underdog. Yeah. Um, he is the quintessential underdog who has heart, will always be himself, and is loyal as fuck to the colours that he wears. It felt to me a bit like channeling your strengths as well, you know, because it was the idea that this guy has this strength, uh, which is his, which is his physical it, strength, it, and his uh, what's the word, being able to take a hit as yeah. well. Um, his well, heart, his, yeah, yeah, his yeah, resilience. He's got a strong chin, resilience, his grit, yeah, exactly, and channel that into something productive and something sportsmanlike, you know, rather than maybe letting it anything cre- challenge it, yeah, challenging it, uh, channeling it into anything creative, yeah. Um, so for someone like me who's come from the underclass, yeah, literally the underclass, like single parent family from a council state in Salford. Mm. Um, to be able to take the challenges um, that life throws at you, because yeah. um, walked and isn't a bad place to grow up. It's fuck it, it's not the best place to grow up. Mm. Like, um, I, I'm proud of everyone that manages to get out of Walkton. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I love the fact that I'm from Walkton. Yeah, and I can use all of my um, experience to make something of myself. I have had jobs not land because I talk funny. Right. Uh-huh. Even though I could do the accent, Yeah. people don't see past it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I have had stuff taken away from me because I don't live in London. Mm. That's all right. I have to accept it and then make the best of what I've got. Yeah. The goon is the same, has the same vibe. Yeah. It's about, it takes the literal strength and he uses it. Mm. But it, there's all, there's a character in it who is um because it's a Canadian ice hockey film, basically. Um and there's this Canadian hotshot who gets sent down to the lower leagues because he thinks he's the shit, mm. but he's pissing it all away, drugs and all that kind of stuff. So he gets demoted as yeah. punishment, basically. Um and him and the Oh, did he get injured? I can't remember. I think he gets injured. Yeah, but he's also yeah he's doing yeah he gets injured, but but he thinks he gets injured and he goes down like he loses contract, Um, but he thinks he's better than this this minor league hockey team that Sean Williams got playing for, and they become roommates. So Sean Williams got trying his best to support him and build him up and drag him drag him into the team, make him part of the family. And what happens is he ends up doing that by following Sean Williams Scott's. By following um, Doug, his character Doug Glatt, by by following Doug's example, yeah. and at the end of the day, you see this cocky, wiry, crackhead, um, arrogant ice hockey player take over the role and support Doug in that way as well. Yeah, yeah. So how he can go from being an outcast to finding this whole family of people who depend on him and who support him as he's putting his body on the line for himself and everyone else... Mm. I just think it's a good message. Yeah, it's yeah. a daft film. Yeah, but if you actually look into what it is, yeah, I think for me it actually got better on a repeat viewing because I remember watching it. You understand the, nuances it uh, on the second. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think you know, it, it, I think a lot of films for me get better with repeat viewing. It's just like albums, you know. Yep. I know And and uh, but I remember thinking first of all, it was difficult to obviously just get beyond that. Um, Sean Sean William Scott character yeah. of, of Stifler because it's very difficult to get yeah. an iconic character out of your head. But and and also the just just the heart of it. I just thought I like you know, it's this, this, about this, heart. It's about heart, yeah. And that's the kind of sweet thing. And you know, you have this Evan Goldberg writing, which is like the sort of super bad esque um, writing and so yep. on, which is like a nice goofy goofy part of it. Which like one of my favorite scenes is where he leaves the cafe when he gets rejected with the, um, the yeah, yeah 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 <laughs> yeah. So just hits him in the face. It's daft, it's isn't it? It's funny yeah. though, you know. Yeah. And it's really sweet, and then it's like you know you just see who this guy is, and that's that really great kind of Evan yeah. Goldberg writing. But yeah, I, I really. Hey, but he's Doug like the character. Sorry to interrupt you, there, mate. Yeah. He his character makes me want to be a better person. Yeah, and makes me want to work harder, and yeah. makes me want to put myself on the line more for the people that are real in my life. Yeah, and do you know what else does that as well? What love on the spectrum. 
Right. <laughs> right. Have you been watching it? Uh, no. <laughs> Get I'm it on Netflix. Yeah, yeah. Really Love good, on the Spectrum yeah. makes me want to be a better person. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I think those are the best types of films, though. I think I, I watch that with them, um, like, you know, It's a Wonderful Life. Yes. Like movies like yeah. that and stuff that, uh, and it, it, people, a lot of people find, I'm very sentimental. Like, you right. know, a lot of people would call it maudling sentimentality, you know, right. with these kind of movies. But yeah, I, I totally. I get a lot of my sort of like I don't know what the word is, but my moral compass yeah. from from movies, right, yeah. you know, because you see these characters and you think that's we're what the same. Want to be? That's what I do. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is why they're so powerful, I think. Yeah, you know, in a lot of ways. But but yeah, no, totally. Um, and and that's what you get. Your, anyone gets a moral compass from what they're saturated by, right? People, family, friends. Yeah. For you and me, we grew up with movies, yeah, yeah. and metal, yeah. That movies was it, metal, yeah. right? Movies, pop punk, and metal. That's that's how we grew up. And the ne- you'll never find a more lovely honest group of people than at download festival 100 percent. do you know what i mean 100 like, percent. do you know the worst crowd i've ever been in was uh was coldplay i went to a coldplay gig at the right. etihad horrible now na- not all of them obviously but no but there was a lot of horrible yeah. nasty characters in yeah. that pit in that crowd yeah yeah download i've never seen anyone any anyone fight be violent no. they're all kind you know they pick you up when you fall exactly that's it lovely people anyway yeah but yes, no no 100 percent. yeah i'm sure you agree um Anyway, um, but yeah, so I, I just I was really impressed with how much I like this film actually, and it did Good. take me a couple of viewings, yeah, I will yeah. say, um, uh, to do it. And but also, I think I like sports movies because I'm not a sport guy at all. And you can do you can do sports movies wrong. This one doesn't. Yeah, I agree. It's, it's the same way that the wrestler. And yeah, I don't know if you saw Foxcatcher. Yes, but yeah, that yeah. was that was a great. Yep. I, I love that movie. But but they, they it sort stops of, being about the sport. You don't make it about the sport. You make it about the people. Yeah, exactly. It's about them. Yep. them what the sport Which is what works with Rocky. in their life. Yep. Yeah, exactly. So um, so yeah, no, I really really liked it. Good. And, and, Watch and, the second one. Yeah, because yeah, one yeah. of my favorite actors in the second one, oh, Cal- cool. Callum Keith Rennie. Ah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yes, you mentioned it yeah. before. Yeah, I, I have that with with actors. I just get obsessed with certain certain actors. I've got such a man crush on Charles Dance, and uh, who's the other one? Um, I just adore. Yeah, Ian Holmes, another yes. one. I think yeah, he's yeah. wonderful yeah. in everything, and it just comes down to that. Oh, uh, David Warner, I absolutely love. Yeah, David I love Warner. David Warner. He's yeah. fantastic. Um, so yeah, uh, well, Vin, thank you very much for thank for, you, mate. for, for uh, coming on and talking it's to us. Nice. Um, this is a point in the show where we call it plug your pluggables. So take that whichever way you want. I but will take it literally. You just plug them up. Yeah. I've got no, I've got no choice based on what's on this chair. But yeah, yeah. I can lend you some stuff. You don't, I think you've already lent it to me without realizing. <laughs> anyway, if you'd like to, <laughs> anyway, <yeah>. anyway, <laughs> no, if you'd like to uh, talk, is there any projects coming up you'd like to talk about? Anything that's in the pipeline? Yeah, man. So uh, we just finished the cinema run for Battle Over Britain, which is our third one from Tin Hat Productions. I say our. I'm just happy to be involved as an actor. Um, so Callum and Andy Byrne mentioned before. This is about a Spitfire crew who just in the Second World War you just churned out like they just spat out bodies, and it's about how you deal with that loss of building up this brotherhood. One of your brothers is dead. Another, another someone else comes in. You, you get closer to them. They die. You might die. You don't know. How do you deal with that loss as people, as Spitfire pilots? It's like Callum did all of the VFX himself. So that's out on Prime now. It's out on Blu-ray, DVD. Um, like you have to, you can get it on YouTube, Xbox. You can rent it, buy it, whatever. Um, it's really good. It's received really well. Like Mark Commode, um, and Simon Mayo enjoyed it. Yeah. They, they, they um, dropped a nice couple of words on their podcast about it which well, was cool well that's a feather in your cap because yeah. I do go by them quite a bit I do Man, t- yeah. tend to agree with Mark on yeah. most things tend so to. do I when they're talking about my films I'm joking yeah. I'm winding <laughs> up um, but yeah. I, so like I said I'm working on this uh, early days but I'm working on the hockey film with Liam um, kind of Shorzy slash Goon-esque Shorzy if you're Shorzy is like a more adult Goon yeah. Canadian ice hockey series um, very very black, very um, NSFW, right. but it's good. Right. It's, it's good, like um, shameful humour. Um, but otherwise, we're just about in, just about starting pre-production for Landship, yeah. which um, I shoot my section this time next year. Was this the tank movie? This saying? is a tank, yeah. yeah. So which is this, based on a short by Callum. So, right? well, it's based on a true story. Oh, okay. So Callum, Callum made a short called Frey Bentos, which is the name of the tank because the. You felt so they they named the tank in real life Frey Bentos because they felt like they felt like meat chucked into a can and sealed yeah. in right. First World War tank it gets stuck in the middle of no man's land. Um, most decorated tank crew of the First World War. Um, Germans trying to take it. They're trying to hold it. They're trying to get back. And there's this whole myth around this tank and the tank crew. And actually, there's not much information out there. Um, Callum made a short about it in in 2013. 
Um, Andy's written a feature um, around that short and around the true story. So now I'm in I'm in prep. I'm talking to IWM and Tank Museum and all that kind of stuff and trying to get as much information about Richardson, the tank commander, who I'm playing. Um, they're, they're, it'll be a mixture of VFX, miniatures, um, and soundstage. Oh, I'm glad to hear there's some miniature work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That always looks great. Yeah. yeah, but they're making the miniatures as big as they can, so there's actual weight and actual gravity to them, so wow. it moves properly. Like sort of third scale miniatures, like quite yeah, large. Yeah, as big as they can. Yeah. Yeah, so, so they're starting that now. They're building them now, and I'm researching now. Um, we film principal photography in a field for about four weeks and like we'll be on a sound stage when we're in the tank yeah but for the outside no man's land stuff that's going to be a field in lincolnshire in february oh wow okay yeah it's going to be fucking horrid it's going to be cold <laughs> um, do you know what i'm going to love it because yeah. have you seen dragon the bruce lee story uh, yeah yeah do you know the bit where he's fighting these demons in his head yeah and he's getting thrown about and all that kind of shit and it, yeah. it's just brutal and it's horrible we're trying to add elements like that like like the brutality of like bone tomahawk and all that kind of stuff yeah. where it's just weird and um, it's not this super shiny Hollywood Masters of the Air type mm. Spielberg type thing. It's fucking horrid. Yeah. Like war is not fun. Yeah. And yeah. even outside of the horrificness of war, you've got this own shit going on in your own head. Yeah. Where you have to deal with actually who were you before the war? Yeah. 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 How, what, who are you going to be after the war? Yeah, yeah. How do you, as a tank commander, how do you present yourself to the men? Yeah. How do those men react to you? It's like your mind is 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 in these places. At Five, once. six different things going yeah, on at once, yeah. where you have to try and temper each one. Yeah. And battle your own demons at the same time. Um, and then we'll we'll try and do it cinematically as well. But that sounds great. It's heavy. It's yeah. good. I'm I'm excited about this one. That sounds really. Yeah, really I'm good, grateful man. for this one. Well, Vin, thank you so much for coming on the show, man. I really appreciate it. And um, uh, you can look for Vin's work uh, on, on um, as you said, Netflix and Prime. Uh, you've got The Terror, which is a fantastic series. I'd, I'd say thank everyone you, check it out. And what a great performance that you gave in that. And uh, yeah, best of luck for the future. Thank great you, man. Projects coming up. Yeah, man, I've loved this. It's been ace. Awesome. Uh, I didn't know you were a metalhead. That's yeah, my favourite bit about this. Yeah, me that's either, it, man. Yeah, we've, a lot yeah. In, lot, we've got a lot in common. I know, right? <laughs> Fucking hell. <laughs> Lovely. Fuck this. We should go for a beer. Aye, yeah. let's go. Okay. <laughs> Cheers. You just can't let them go. Go. Stay on the road. Keep clear to the moors. Thank you. You saw me standing alone. Enough. Enough. Yeah, I love how we're singing that for completely different reasons, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Shall I mention the, the film that I really like? Well, of course. It, it It's only tradition to mention it, I'd say. Yeah. An American werewolf in Paris. No, come on, get it right. Okay, London. There you go. Yeah, uh, the second best werewolf we've ever made. <laughs> of course. After Paris. And I'm singing it for the actual best team in the world right now, yes. Of go Blue, go Pepsi, all that stuff. Go Blue, go, Pe- <laughs> go Pepsi, yeah. Go sponsored. Blue or go home. It's crazy. Yeah. Uh, no, Chelsea. But that- <laughs> Calm down. <laughs> that was a lovely conversation, though. He was a really decent guy. Yeah, no, he was he was great, man. And um, did you hear what he said about the um, you know the filming thing and being called back? Yeah, imagine having Ridley Scott see your dailies and like being called back to Budapest to film. Yeah. Oh, that's crazy. I know, man. Like you know, you, you certainly know you put in a good performance if that's the case. Uh, but no, yeah, it was a great one, man. And uh, you know, hopefully next time Vin makes the effort to uh, to come down, you might uh, you know you might make it yourself. I know you were ill. <laughs> Oh, oh, there we go. There we still, go. Got yeah. it, still, still got it. Still got it. I can't no. go to school today, mummy. <laughs> I'll always make the extra effort for a blue. Do not worry. Of course. So that's all from Vin, Matt, and myself today. So thank you so much for joining us. If you'd like to hear more from us, subscribe to our Spotify channel where you can leave us a, a lovely rating and a lovely comment. That would be lovely. I just keep saying lovely. Um, you can also find us on YouTube and Twitch now by searching for the name Matt and Mike Paul Focus. Say goodbye, Matt. Bye, Matt. Say goodbye, Vin, wherever you are. And that's goodbye from me as well. Goodbye. It's like he's a haunted spirit. <laughs> I know. Vin, we can hear you. Ooh.